So we must do two things, two great things together to encompass that enormous new view that lies before us, but to encompass it within the framework of science, to see it within the whole categorical framework of science, and to see that these two are not separate, but that they are wedded. The bigness of the idea, the newness of the idea, the greatness of it is one with the structure of science, the structure of being itself. All right, so I'd like to just start um, this afternoon's session by tracing that um, story of John W. Dorley in relation to the matrix, in relationship to the the emerging of the matrix so that we get a, a feeling and a setting for the, the whole atmosphere from which that matrix arose. I think if we pick up the story around 1938, that will uh, suffice. And this is uh, based on uh, Peggy Brooks' book, John W. Dorley the scientific evolution of the science of Christian science. There she tells that story, and I have uh, in my notes abbreviated uh, that information and trimmed it back so that it makes a, a clear-cut line to the point that we want to see. Well, in 1938, we have to realize that at that time, uh, two things were already known, had already been seen. And those two things were the days of creation and the definition of God, the correlation between the days of creation and the definition of God on page 465 of the textbook. From 1938 to 1939, two further things were seen. First, he saw the relationship of the thousand-year periods with the days of creation. That was for the first time. He gave that particular subject at his association meeting in 1939. And also, at that same period, he began to see the four orders. He began to realize that there were four orders. In 1938, his attention had been drawn to, uh, to that uh, fact by the Mother Church, who criticized him severely for the fact that he always referred to the seven-fold uh, definition of God, the one order in the Christian Science textbook, uh, that he continually uh, talked about continually talking about the definition of God. And so the uh, Mother Church contacted him and um, critiqued him and said, did he not realize that there were two other orders of the seven synonymous terms in the textbook? And what did he have to say about that? So uh, you can see that John W. Dorley was really uh, a love scientist, <laughs> a natural, really, because he, he did not take that criticism the way many of us would take a criticism, namely that we would want to, to shut it off, to not to hear it, not to take it in, that it would uh, upset us, it would fluctuate us. That's what a, a criticism always does. It will fluctuate the system that has been going along and moving along smoothly and harmoniously and feeling that it was uh, completely stable, you know, that sense of stability that we love. And something comes in and upsets that, and that's what a criticism does. But he did not try to dampen that criticism. He did not try to dampen that negative feedback, but he opened up to it. He took it in. You hear that that's the 
love sense that he accepted the information, took it in, not as a criticism, but as information. And with that information, he could make the next step in the whole development of the idea. So uh, it was just at that time as he did that that he began to become aware that there are indeed four orders. In 1940, the, the understanding of these orders began to develop. It's not as though he had the complete understanding of them the moment he realized there were four orders. But by 1940, he was already beginning to understand them. He presented them in his association meeting of 1940, along with the subject of revelation. But the connection, uh, and he was mainly focused on the on three orders because that fourth order was perhaps not uh, quite in place yet. Uh, and so he could mainly focus on the three orders that were in the textbook. But the connection between those three orders and the divine processes of word, Christ, Christianity, and science had not yet been seen. That's very hard for us to imagine, isn't it? Say it again that he was aware of the three or four orders, especially the three orders as they existed in the textbook, but he wasn't aware that they had a connection with the word Christ, Christianity, and science. Mm -hmm. In 1941, he began to see the correlation between the days of creation and the commandments and the Beatitudes and the Lord's Prayer, all written in the word order, right? There are all instances of the word, but they are reflecting the word, the Christ, Christianity, and science. He did not know that at that time. He only saw the correlation, a correlation between each presentation of uh, those seven. The three orders uh, were mentioned again in his um, association meeting that year. And the fourth order was set forth for the first time. He could see that the word order when seen subjectively would become the science order. So in 1942, for the first time, the four orders were identified as expressing the divine processes of operation, word, Christ, Christianity, and science, 1942. Four orders equaling four operations, so that for the very first time, the seven and the four were linked together. Isn't that beautiful? What a, what a beautiful story. It's hard for us to imagine because we come in and everything is in place and we pick it up as already being in place and we don't realize what steps, what spiritual footsteps have gone before to bring about that development. In his association meeting in uh, 1942, he presented the subject of Christ and Christmas and also gave the correlation of the seven and the four uh, specifically for the first time. According to uh, Peggy Brook, she says that only later, only later did the candlestick become associated with the fourth order of science. <laughs> Think of that. Imagine that, that he would see that order uh, prior to associating it 
with the candlestick. And of course, it is the candlestick order. Um, in 1943, he had another association meeting. He was still uh, uh, going strong with his uh, associations and gave his association on Revelation 21, chapter 21 bringing out the first sense of the levels of consciousness and bringing them out, bringing that whole uh, story out from two standpoints, therefore, from the standpoint of the city four square and the standpoint of the city of our God, which we know uh, today are the levels of divine science and absolute Christian science. A very important point, because this was his atmosphere for the next three years. He remained in that atmosphere of divine science and absolute Christian science. And what took place in those next three years, from 1943 to 1945, was the unfolding of the matrix. So the matrix came out of that whole atmosphere of divine science and absolute Christian science. And the atmosphere of revelation, really, he could give birth to that matrix. And um, he never set out to do that. He never tried to do it. He never calculated with the human mind what it might be possible to do with those symbols, those values. He didn't even know that he was putting it into a matrix form. But gradually he began to see the infinitely ordered reflections of being that we now know as the matrix. You see, because Genesis and Revelation had given him the seven and the four, you see, he spent all those year, early years with Genesis, 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 since really, I think, in 1913 or 1914, he had uh, taken the days of creation every single day of his life, went over those days of creation. And so that Genesis order was, well, not the Genesis order, but the seven days of creation because he hadn't seen the Genesis order yet, he hadn't seen the 29 subtones, but the, those seven days, and then being moved into the whole field of revelation, of St. John's revelation, with the four, you see, the seven and the four, and really the other four, but... Uh, not so evident at that point, but that atmosphere became the key that he needed to unlock the further step. So he saw that in Revelation that John indicated not just four, as we said this morning, but a four times four, each side of that city having three gates or three aspects of reflection so that every side has four aspects of reflection when we include its own self-reflection, bringing out 16 standpoints, bringing out a calculus. Um, then he could sense from that and apparently he saw this with the science order first that the four 
must be within the seven, that the four were within the seven. Then he could sense that the other orders, too, must have the four within them, that if the science order had the four in it, that then the word, Christ, Christianity, too, must have the four within them, and so that took him further into the subject and um, led to the next step. i uh, tried to find my notes here. If you could see them, you would be very sympathetic. <laughs> Where is that? Just a moment. Yes, here it is. Here it is. Yeah, that, you see, it wasn't until the mid-40s then we think, didn't he already know that the seven had the four within them? Didn't he already have those 29 subtones? But he didn't. You see, he saw the matrix before he saw the 29 subtones in the days of creation. That's almost more profound. To, to my sense, that's, that's more profound. To have been able to take those capitalized terms and to structure them according to their four reflections is, to my sense, uh, an even greater thing than to see that, uh, that he might have had that key already from the days of creation, but he didn't. And it was in the mid-40s then that, that uh, there was a, uh, a feeding back of all of this uh, activity within consciousness, and a new interest uh, arose in the days of creation for him. So up to then, he'd only seen seven tones, and in 1946, he began to see the subtones, the three, three, five, five, four, seven, and two, that you are all uh, familiar with. So how did he, how could he have deduced, uh, how could he have deduced that matrix first? It, only through his spiritual sense, his spiritual intuition, his love, his deep consecration for the fundamentals, for those days of creation which became numerals of infinity to him and which became synonymous terms to him, that he went through that, that development in his own consciousness until he was, he was those synonymous terms, he was those capitalized terms. And so it was... Uh, a, a spiritual naturalness, a spiritual intuitiveness, a spiritual logos within him, or logic within him. His scientific sense uh, decoded that whole proposition, and he had, uh, as we know, no text. Having no text uh, means that that matrix is a deductive matrix. It is a divinely deductive matrix. He had no text with which he worked. If we look at our other matrices, such as the, the uh, matrix of the uh, prophets or the Christ matrix, the matrix of the epistles or the Christianity matrix or the textbook matrix of Christian science, these are inductive matrices. They are formulated uh, from a text through the inductive method of science. So uh, he relied on that uh, deduction, that divine deduction, and um, really brought to light a new sense of, of creativity, a new sense of the creative order, that he began to see that 
actually the four two are creative. We always think of the seven, especially in the word order, as being creative, but he saw that that the four themselves are creative and that in every order, therefore, you have a a start to that order at the at the word point, the point of the word, that that order then has a logical development or logical course over which it runs. Uh, That logic is brought out through the Christ. It brings forth a result or an effect at the point of Christianity, brings forth a conclusion. And finally, he could see that, uh, that all three that uh, we want to call it the input, the processing, the, the uh, output, the word, the Christ, Christianity, all together are science. All belong to the feedback principle and uh, feedback through that principle back to the word again so that you have a great uh, creativity going on through the four, that the four give to the seven uh, a a creative aspect that is non-linear, we could say. It's, it's non-linear. So that those orders that look linear to us, appear to be linear to us, laid out in a linear order, they appear to have a, they appear to have a start and a finish and a middle to them. But by virtue of that fourth aspect of, of science, of the feedback principle, that feedback principle renders them non-linear. They never have a finish. They never come to an end. There's continually a feeding back, feeding back, feeding back. And in the matrix, we will see that in every order, there is a feeding back of that order to itself and a feeding forward of that order to the next order until the conclusion at the point of science itself, or sorry, of science as science in the matrix, and then you have a great feeding back to uh, the divine principle and the principle of science itself. So, um, yes, what else do I have to say to you? Yeah, I've said all that. Oh, yes, it, it was in, um, that's interesting, that it was in September of 1945. Uh, he was apparently going, John Dorley was traveling all over England giving talks on Revelation. He just didn't stop. He kept talking and talking <laughs> about Revelation, and that's a a great indication, you know, when you're going around talking about something that it's really on your mind, and it stays on your mind, and it it works on you, and it wakes you up in the middle of the night, and and it just uh, really haunts you the whole time that you're speaking about something. And so he was giving um, uh, this talk on Revelation in Bristol, England, and it was at that talk that for the first time he had the, uh, the chart, the large chart, uh, and he didn't know what to call it. It was just a chart, and he called it a chart. And uh, there was a woman in the audience who had a mathematical background. I think she was a mathematician. And she came up to him and said, did you know that what you have there is a matrix. And that was the first time that the term uh, matrix came into focus. And so ever since that time, uh, John Dorley's work has been known as the matrix. And so it is the matrix. (laughs) Not a matrix, but the matrix. Um, He later printed that matrix on a card 
uh, in order to use it as a study aid. That is the card that we're all familiar with and have seen. It's uh, uh, been around ever since those early days. And um, But something else was going on with him at the same time, and I said that he was in that whole atmosphere of revelation. And so the standpoints of divine science, absolute Christian science, and Christian science began to impress themselves upon him more and more and more. Together with the various combinations of the synonymous terms for God that constitute those levels with their place values. In other words, what was emerging at the same time? The first, first sense of the model of being, the first model of being. That model of being, when it appeared for the first time, was printed on the reverse of the matrix card. So you see now that the matrix was printed first, then the model of being. It had three levels to it, and he did not have the fourth level of science, but he had a kind of an indication to that fourth level of science because he said there that those three were the three metaphysical standpoints of the one all-inclusive science. So he was uh, pinpointing in that way the whole science of Christian science. Thus, uh, I guess by 1945 or 46, um, yes, that was September 45, so you see that by the close of 45 or right around uh, 1946 that we already had the matrix and the model of being. In 1946, uh, he wrote The Pure Science of Christian Science and had, as I told you before, the matrix chart therein with no explanation. <laughs> no explanation. And in 1949, he uh, edited that, uh, uh, that book, that writing, and in part two, he gave a detailed explanation of what um, that matrix is. <clears throat> 